Hello, I'm Nancy Mendoza, Director of Communications and Membership at The Canary. Welcome to this week's Canary Pod. Today I'll be talking with two of our editors about two of the week's biggest stories. Later, Emily Apple will tell us about the recent High Court ruling against the Tories' benefits cap. But first up, I'll be discussing the tragic news of the devastating fire at Grenfell Tower with Bex Sumner. The awful scenes of the Grenfell Tower fire have been very hard to miss and indeed hard to see. For various reasons, the final death toll is not yet clear, but the authorities are currently reporting in excess of 70 deaths so far, with the expectation that this number may still rise considerably. Bex, can you explain to us in a little more detail the events of that night? It's been a horrific story. Um, it started a little after midnight on the 14th of June, and there's a fire that broke out um, in a single apartment um, in Grenfell Tower, which is like a 24 story tower in, Kens- in the borough of Kensington in Chelsea. Um, and then within minutes, the fire engulfed a lot of the building. Um, there's no sprinklers, no fire alarm, one exit. And, you know, there were people stuck on high floors high up. There were stories of parents throwing babies out of their windows to try and save them. And like you say, we still don't have a death count. I think the police, the latest death count from the police was 79, but it's widely expected. Well, those that's not confirmed dead, 79 presumed dead, but um, it's widely expected to go higher still. And then there's all the people who survived who've lost everything but their lives. So a whole community has been ripped apart. Um, and yeah. People are angry and frustrated. They're not getting information. They're not getting what they need. So it's horrific. And the, the, the problem seems to be, you know, it's pretty widely agreed that the problem's with the cladding. So over the over the time since Grenfell, there have been, um, you know, there have been investigations into the cladding um, and on cladding in similar in similar buildings. Um, and yet yeah, the, the 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 cladding that was used to cover Grenfell was has been linked to other fires around the world. It's like the cheaper, more flammable flammable version of the of the available. That is just unbelievable. I I looking at the pictures of the tower. Um, I'm really shocked. I didn't ever expect to see something like that in this country. I mean, I grew up with the uh, fire safety campaigns in the 1980s and a lot of the regulation that came in there about you know, using fire retardant uh, fabrics and, and materials for, for soft furnishings you know, should really mean that this couldn't happen. You know, a small fire might start, but it would never take hold. Exactly, and that's how it's meant to work. I mean, the whole... The whole rescue operation, the whole the advice all the residents had had, the whole rescue operation was based around the stay put policy, which means that if a fire breaks out in one in one flat, the you know the quality of material is good enough that it's com- compartmentalised them there for at least half an hour, forty five minutes, which gives the firefighters time to rescue people in the rest of the building. And you know that's an that's an extra tragedy is that you know you you want to have faith in the quality of the quality of materials that are used in your building, and the, the entire rescue operation was based around that. And something went horribly wrong. And, and even worse, the cladding was used, you know, to wrap around the building to make it prettier for the millionaires living nearby. I mean, how have we got here? This could have been prevented, surely. It quickly emerged after the fire. The next morning, I think it was already all over social media that the, the residents had been claim, you know, complaining for years, raising, issues, raising concerns about safety and fire safety. And they'd, they'd not been listened to. In fact, they even tried to get lawyers involved, but because of legal aid cuts, um, they couldn't they couldn't get represented. So um, there's a there's a, a strong case for arguing that had they been rich, um, they would have been heard. You know, the, the the residents, as it's been widely reported, residents wrote on a blog saying that the only way they thought that the the landlords and the council would listen to them was if a tragedy like this happened. Um, the 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 landlords of the building also got legal warnings about fire safety in two other tower blocks. Um, this didn't come out of the blue. There was a whole 
long history of background to this. So what has the response been from both local and national governments? You know, the, the response since the tragedy has been even worse. It's been it's been absolutely appalling. Residents are complaining that they've been left without information. It's basically been down to communities to organise and coordinate basic things like food and clothing um, for for the victims of the fire, the, the people who survived. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of anger there. People are taking to the streets. And the response from the, the response from central government has been pretty horrendous too. I mean. Theresa May went there and she didn't, she didn't speak to the residents um, and she ended up having to run out through a side entrance of the church. Um, she's had to apologise for a failure of the state quote of the disaster, just saying the, the you know the local and the national response uh, wasn't up to scratch. Um, um, and yeah, once once again, she's it's just been a it's been a catalogue of catastrophes from Theresa May. There was none of the decisive leadership that you really need at a time like this. Like um, she announced on on. On the 22nd of June, she announced that there were 600 tower blocks with similar cladding and then quickly had to, re- you know, her spokespeople quickly had to retract that and say, no, it was 600 tower blocks with any kind of cladding. Um, the lack of clarity, that people need information now. People need really clear information quickly and reliably and uh, it, they're just not getting it. How on earth is this woman still Prime Minister? That's the question. Yeah, that is the question. How is she still Prime Minister? I think because they don't want to risk a leadership battle at the moment. I think it's probably the only reason she's still prime minister. <laughs> yeah, they're letting her take the stick for it. And yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So people have actually been out demonstrating about some of the issues surrounding Grenfell, haven't they? Um, well, there was the ones, there was the um, advertised day of rage that went from um, Shepherd's Bush to um, Parliament Square that was really, really, really hyped in the media and... It was basically the right wing press trying to make people feel guilty for being angry and having a voice by saying, oh, our emergency services are overstretched. So therefore you shouldn't protest and you shouldn't be angry. And it was very peaceful. It was very small. It was about 400 people, but very angry and very passionate. And it was just people taking to the streets just to say, no, we need justice. So I don't quite understand. Are, are we saying that people are protesting about the emergency services and their response? No, the point about the emergency services was just that because they're so stretched at the moment between Grenfell and the terrorist instance, the right wing press kind of went into meltdown by saying that there shouldn't be protests because the emergency services were already stretched. I think the fire service in particular, they've gone out of their way to say it's too early for them to tell how their response was affected by the cut. And they just don't know at this point. So have we heard from any firefighters about their experience on the day? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a really moving letter from um, a firefighter, which, which we published on the Canary. He talks about um, what happened that night. And, you know, the fact is a colleague was getting up as breathing apparatus to help, you know, to help a casualty. And it's, um, it's tough reading. Um, and, in that he talks about he talks about the impact of the cuts and how devastating they've been. I mean, fire services budgets in England have been cut by seventeen percent since twenty ten, and you know the fire brigades union head has been speaking out about it, saying just a few months ago, saying that undermining the effectiveness of fire services there. As Emily says, it's too it's too early to say whether that did affect the result of um, the, what happened at Grenfell. We could, you know it's clear that the the fire the firefighters just went above and beyond. You know the call of duty mm. in very difficult circumstances. But yes, I mean, there's lots of other aspects about cuts and austerity on this as well. You know, That's really got to be an extraordinarily difficult thing for a firefighter to deal with. Um, I, I, I can't even imagine. Well, one of the things Boris Johnson did when he was mayor was cut the amount of councillors available to firefighters for um, therapeutic support. And he cut them from 14 councillors down to two. So when you have politicians like Theresa May praising the emergency services, praising the response of the firefighters, they've got no mental health support. Um, As Bex was saying earlier, reading the accounts of 
um, the firefighters who've been through this, many, many of them are saying it's something that they've never seen before, that it's the sort of fire you only see once in a lifetime. And they don't have the mental health support to help them deal with that trauma afterwards. Now, again, volunteers have stepped in. There's been calls going out through different psychotherapeutic groups for counsellors um, and therapists to step in and offer voluntary work. And people are doing that. But again, that is fantastic. And it's brilliant that people are doing that. But it's not right that those essential services are being cut. And it's the same across mental health support with the Grenfell Towers victims, with the victims of terrorism. There's been massive cuts to mental health budgets. So even when the people are trying to deal with the legacy of this trauma and they're trying to process that trauma, we don't have the services to support those people. And we don't have the services you know, for our firefighters who've done this amazing job that everyone is praising our firefighters, but they've got two counsellors in London to help them deal with that trauma. And that is just absolutely disgusting. Uh, and we see it across professions of cuts causing more and more stress and lack of mental health support within the workplace, meaning that more and more people going off sick. And it's, it's as you say, it's a complete false economy. It's not what we should be doing to people who are doing fantastic jobs anyway and even from a purely capitalist point of view if you wanted to take it from that point of view you're creating a sick population you're you're creating an unsustainable population and it just doesn't make any sense and Theresa May went on about creating this revolution in mental health and throughout her time And throughout the coalition's time, all they've done is cut budgets to mental health. Um, With the schools cuts, they're having to cut school counsellors because they don't have the money to pay them anymore. Child and adolescent mental health services across the country have had severe cuts. There's huge waiting lists. People aren't getting support. And these kind of tragedies kind of bring that into focus as well because you realise how little support is out there and how much of that support is being carried by volunteers and volunteers are great but when volunteers are constantly being asked to fill in the gaps of paid staff and services that should be paid for there's a massive problem because there's only a limited capacity that volunteers have as well. And we can't have a society that relies on volunteerism. It's not sustainable. So it strikes me that this event is going to have uh, a great deal of political fallout if if it hasn't already. There's a, there's a lot of political strands coming out of this. There's privatisation. You've got corporations competing over outsourcing what used to be functions of the council, um, and you know they're competing to make profit. So is that why? Is that why? Two pounds extra wasn't spent on the cladding. You know, we don't know yet. But um, there's, a, there's the whole question about the welfare, you know, what 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 we want from our society. Where, do we want a welfare society where people are actually put in decent housing? Um, I'd say that's a pretty basic requisite. But uh, this is this has highlighted how badly wrong that's gone somewhere along the way. There's the inequality aspect, you know. There's, there's the millionaire residents now complaining that victims are being housed in the same tower block as some of the victims are being housed in the same in the same tower block as them. Um, Good grief! Yeah, they're um, they're they're, saying, they're worried about property prices, and they're being moved to the affordable part of the development as well. So all the luxury bits, like the gym, in the rich bit of the apartments, the the Grenfell residents who are being housed there, they're not going to be able to use half the facilities of this block anyway because it was already designated as affordable housing. And yes, and now they're complaining that, yes, it's going to affect their property prices. And it just this it just amplifies that lack of compassion and inequality that exists in this country, and especially in the microcosm of London where this exists. And it, it's just abhorrent. So where does that leave us? Um, what, what can happen next? Well, the government's ordered a public inquiry. Um, so... That, that could take a few years to, to you know, to go through, you know, to pan out. Um, I think what, what, what we need to do, what, what needs to happen is that the issue of 
Grenfell um, needs to stay right at the top of people's minds. We've got to, we've got to take care of we've got to take care of the housing situation in this country. We've got to sort out inequality. Um, we've got to start acting with compassion. Um, you know, and build a society that works for that, that looks after you know everyone. Um, so yes, I mean, there's going to be there's going to be a lot of legal wrangling going on, investigations and inquiries and stuff. Um, but we can't let those be used to just um, put the issue on the back burner because it's you know there's 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 600 tower blocks with cladding in the UK. Um, still unclear how many of those are similar. Lots of them are still being tested at the moment. Um, so th- there's there's potentially a lot of other people living in a very precarious situation and that needs to be sorted out really, really quickly. Yeah, it's it's really clear that this is a story we're going to keep coming back to. There's a lot more yet to come and a lot of people for whom you know, this is only the start of, of quite a difficult journey. So you might have noticed that we've been experimenting a little bit with the format and the way that we actually record and present Canary Pod. We would really love to have your feedback. Um, so let us know what you're liking and what you're not liking so much. Um, you can tweet us at Canary Pod or you can email podcast at the canary.co. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to highlight our new membership scheme at The Canary. Um, It's a great way of supporting independent journalism. It's a monthly sign up. There are a few different levels you can choose from. To see that, there's information at www.thecanary.co forward slash membership. And uh, thanks for your support. Now, Emily, you've been looking this week at an extraordinary case in the High Court. Uh, Can you tell us a bit about that, please? The judgment came out on the 22nd of June. It was specifically in relation to the housing benefit cap. Now, the housing benefit cap, it was was introduced in 2013 and it was extended in 2016. And it puts a limit on how much housing benefit a family can apply for. And so in London in particular, and the South East, where property prices are very high, this is having a massive impact on families. Um, uh, according to Shelter, 27% of homeless households in London have been capped. And in some places, it's as high as 55%. And Shelter predict that that number will quadruple with the 2016 cap. So the case in the High Court was from four lone parent families with children under two, some some of whom had been, experienced domestic violence and were sort of trying to get themselves sorted. Now, they couldn't afford their homes and food and, you know, they, they were having to, they were being forced into a position between choosing between paying their rent or paying their food. And one of their solicitors said, you know, it was having a catastrophic impact upon vulnerable lone parent families. And the point with the benefit cap is that certain benefits are exempt. So certain benefits like working tax credits are exempt if you're in work. Now, what these families were arguing was because their children were under two, that they couldn't reach the work threshold because there was no childcare and they had their caring responsibilities. And... The judgment found in their favour, but it was also a very, very damning judgment. Um, Justice Collins actually said that this benefit cap was causing, his quote was, real misery is being caused to no good purpose. Good grief. These are vulnerable, lone parent families suffering under poverty, not being able to pay their rent or not being able to put food on their tables for no good purpose purpose and it is such a damning indictment of what this government has done to the most vulnerable in society. So that sounds like quite an important ruling but who is it who's actually been found guilty? Well the ruling is against the government it's found that government policy is unlawful now the problem is it's a high court judgment so the government can choose to appeal this judgment Um, if they choose not to it would have to mean legislative changes to the way the benefit caps applied. 
But at the moment, we don't know whether the government's going to appeal. But unfortunately, given the government's record on appealing these types of decisions, it is likely to be a case that runs and runs for a while. So, Emily, this isn't actually the first time that this has happened uh, to Theresa May's government. Um, In really quite recent times, there have been other cases that are similar that have been heard. Yes, that's right. I mean, in in the last um, month, there's been three cases altogether where the government's found to have broken the law. Um, The one before that was in the Supreme Court um, over people who had indefinite life leave to remain who were deported after serving prison sentences and um, the Supreme Court so that's the highest court upheld that um, the government had breached the Article 8 human rights um, right to family and private life um, because both men in the case had strong family ties and family in this country and they were deported straight away and told that they could appeal later And what that case found was that there were too many difficulties for the men to be able to give their lawyers instructions and too many financial and logistical barriers to giving evidence from abroad. So essentially, by deporting them and then giving them right to appeal, they weren't giving them a fair hearing. And then then the other case, which was even more disgusting, um, was in the appeal court. Um, there were 75 people who were washed up in 1998 on the British sovereign base area in Cyprus. And these people have been living in really appalling conditions there, including children. And they, they've been living in accommodation that was supposed to be demolished 20 years ago. So how did these people actually come to be shipwrecked? on Cyprus. Um, I I don't quite understand. Were they refugees? Yes, yes. They were refugees and they were shipwrecked and they they ended up on the British sovereign base area. And um, in 2014, Theresa May refused to accept responsibility for them. And despite them being on a British sovereign base area, said that they couldn't resettle in the UK and that this area was outside of the Refugee Convention. So she she wouldn't take any responsibility for them. Oh, that's unbelievable. Um, but on the 25th of May, the Court of Appeal decided that they'd acted unlawfully and that these people did have a right to, to be in this country. But they've been there since 1998 in appalling conditions, in housing that was due to be demolished 20 years ago. And it is just disgusting that it's taken so long for them to get any justice at all. And that successive governments have tried to dismiss their claims and wash responsibility for them away. So what can we actually do to avoid a situation like this? I mean, it's very clear that people who need it are not getting the adequate housing that they need. I mean, Grenfell Tower itself was home to, I believe, quite a number of refugees, including a, a Syrian refugee who actually died in the fire. Um, uh, my sense is that the resources are out there to fix this, but but can we? How do we actually fix this? I, I think it's a fundamental change of attitude, and one of the things that's come out from Grenfell is um, Jeremy Corbyn and other Labour MPs and a lot of other people talking about requisitioning empty houses. Um, there, there's these houses in London that are owned as tax havens. They're not being used as accommodation. It's not a lack of housing. It's the way our housing is being used. And to have properties, really properties worth millions of pounds that are sitting there empty because their owners are using them as tax havens and as corporations is just disgusting. And again, it comes back to this fundamental imbalance, this fundamental inequality and this fundamental question, and especially in talking in talking in terms of refugees and asylum seekers, where we've had for years this narrative where immigration and refugees gets blamed for the problems in our NHS and our problems in housing and our problems in schools, rather than looking at government funding, looking at the fact that the rich have got richer while the poor have got poorer. And it's, it's kind of like we've scapegoated the most vulnerable people instead of turning our attention 
to where it needs to be and where those fights need to be. Because if we address that inequality, we have enough wealth, we have enough accommodation, we have all these things to support refugees and asylum seekers. We, we don't need to be doing what we're doing. So it sounds like, in theory, we could actually have enough housing to actually give everybody a home that needs one. Have I understood that correctly? Well, I think it could be, because I think there are so many empty buildings that just aren't being used. And um, so, for example, I live in Cornwall, which is a totally different situation, but so many of our properties down here are second homes, they're holiday lets, and that's pushed up rents, it's pushed up prices for the locals, so... Um, young people down here can't afford to buy it's pushed property prices way above wages so even things where second homes are taxed heavily um, or aren't given the council tax rebates or all those kind of things to address that quality and inequality in home ownership and who gets to own land in this country is fundamentally important you know, in Kensington and Chelsea, there's like there's there's 1,400 empty empty house empty homes. Um, it's criminal, really. Mm. It's land banking. It's people doing it to, to to get themselves a profit in the long term. Or if you want, if you want across London, there's 19,845 homes that sat idle for over six months in 2016 across London. 19,000 homes is basically a small town. That. I, I'm finding that quite difficult to get my head round. Um, there's been clearly multiple failures here, but what's really positive is the way that the communities have really banded together in the aftermath. Um, and actually, on Friday night on Newsnight, I thought Jonathan Friedland made a really important point when he was on a panel, um, incidentally, with our editor-in-chief, Carrie ann Mendoza, um, and he was talking about the Brexit debate and he, he was talking about you know, the character of, of our different communities. And uh, let, let's just hear that now. One from the room. Uh, I, I, I just think one of the big arguments after leave, uh, after the referendum and, and during it was the notion that there were two tribes in this country. There was the sort of anywheres who were urban and cosmopolitan and there were the somewheres who still had British values of community. Now, we've seen in the last month in areas that would have been labelled classic anywhere areas, Finsbury Park, uh, Grenfell Tower, that mm. area, diverse, multilingual, multicultural community, those are real communities where people really pull together. Yeah. There is no monopoly on patriotism or community or British values on the somewhere side or the anywhere side. On that note. It just really goes to show that we can't assume anything. And I think, you know, through the general election, what we've learned is that people actually respond really, really well to hope and compassion. And what I think the Tories have, you know, not understood is that fear isn't what motivates people it, it is that that more positive hopeful kind of message I, I think for me what's really been shown through having Jeremy Corbyn as an opposition leader is that people have had something to rally around as something different and it's allowed the vast majority of us who don't agree with that agenda who want cooperation who want community who want a welfare state to have something in the mainstream to support and come together around. But I also think that the way communities have responded to all these tragedies has been outstanding, whether it was the, the vigil at Finsbury Park, um, the, the community response to Grenfell. I mean, it's appalling that um, the procedures set up by the state were so lacking for the Grenfell residents. Equally, it is amazing to see how people can self-organise and sort things out for themselves and show that actually we can survive without the Tories. We don't need all the stuff that they're doing. We can just get on and sort it out and that people want to sort things out. And out of all the terrible stuff that's come out of all these things, I think that's one thing to take away from it, it is that people do come together and they do want to work together. And yes, we've got these residents in Kensington complaining, but what this election has shown is that they are the minority and that they are now losing and they're not having that voice anymore and they're not going to have that protection anymore. 
because the rest of us are speaking out now. I completely agree. People have gotten really motivated through this. And my sense is that you know, what we're experiencing now is a real grassroots movement. We're, we're seeing people actually you know, banding together and being willing to speak up and to do something. Yeah, it's kind of that cliche of, you know, you be the change you want to be, you know, you create that change that you want to see in your lives and you don't wait for the government to do it. Now, arguably, we shouldn't be waiting for enormous tragedies to do that either. And that's something that all of us should be doing in our communities and that we, we should be trying to build in our communities. But that sense of empowerment that actually we can do this, we can create these alternatives is, is fantastic and, and really, really important. Absolutely. And it's not always obvious stuff, is it, Emily? You wrote a beautiful story about what's been happening in your, in your neck of the woods um, in response to Grand you know, mm. Communities in Cornwall getting creative and thinking about what they could offer. Yeah, they're, um, they set up the scheme for... Um, the residents of Grenfell and firefighters to come and spend a week in Cornwall and have a holiday just to get away from things and to be by the sea and to be in the countryside and somewhere rural and and just have that space away and it's called Cornwall Hugs Grenfell and it's just a beautiful community response and over 100 people so far have pledged rooms houses and stuff where, where people can come and stay and there's funding for people's travel to come down here as well. And it is a really, really lovely community response. That is just absolutely gorgeous. And it's a really lovely way, I think, because especially when you're sort of 300 miles away from, from events, it's quite hard to think of how you can respond and offer practical solidarity. And this just does it perfectly. Cornwall Hugs Grenfell, I absolutely love that. What an extraordinary thing to be doing. And, you know, it just goes to show that even from 300 miles away, people are demonstrating that compassion and and reaching out to other people who are really in need at the moment. Um, it's, It's absolutely, you know, what we talk about at the Canary and a great way of closing off this episode of Canary Pod. Don't get angry, get involved.